Hi. Uh, it's intentionally Blake. We're at New York Comic Con. Scream for us, New York Comic Con. That, that is the most official intro this show has ever had. That is. Uh, so we're actually going to do a Q&A episode. Uh, and so we're going to have people line up right over here on this side. And then you can come up and you'll tell me the question. And I'll repeat it for the crowd because they don't have a, a crowd mic. So if you have things you want to ask Dan and me to talk about, please kind of uh, come on up over here. Uh, hit us with questions. It can be about basically anything. Uh, you know how we are. Except rings of power. Except rings of power because we'll actually probably put that episode up first. So it'll be in time traveling back in time. Um, so... So, yeah, come on up here. Just right up here. Yeah, go ahead. Hit me. What do you got? Hi, how you doing? I, this is, why did no one want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> A writing question. Uh, and also, Dan, you wrote one of my favorite series ever, the John Cleaver series. Oh, thank you very much. By the way, thank you for coming to a Brandon Sanderson panel and immediately complimenting me. <laughs> it is an us panel. <laughs> And you are deserving of compliments. Your books my are awesome. My wife is the brand fan. Sweet. Awesome. Well, you're my favorite. <laughs> um, my question, general writing question. When it comes to writing an antagonist, um, how do you go about sympathizing with your antagonist when you're making them do all the bad things? Ooh. Ooh. How do you sympathize with an antagonist when you're making him do so many bad things while writing? And also, Dan is awesome was the other part of the question. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That part wasn't a question. Mm-hmm. How, how do you s create sympathy for an antagonist? Yeah. Oh, well... Dan, do you split antagonist and, uh, and villain in your head into two separate I roles? I do, actually. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Well, how do you do that? Like, so, what's the difference? The antagonist is the one who is stopping the protagonist from getting what they want. Okay. Whereas the villain is a bad guy. Okay, so you can be an antagonist without being evil. Yeah. So we might say that Ben is the antagonist of our podcast. <laughs> he is also the villain, though, so that's kind of a bad uh, example. No, but like in the uh, the Miss Marvel Disney Plus show, like there's villains, and they're like this whole group of bad guys, but the antagonists, for the most part, are her parents, because they're the ones constantly stopping her from being the superhero she wants to be. They're not villains, but they are antagonists. Um, and, you know, in that sense, they were... I, they, they were two of my favorite characters. They had a lot of personality. They did a lot of good things. They were really fun and exciting, even though they were kind of the constant wet blankets saying, no, don't go be out and be a superhero. You know, I divide in my head e even villain into a couple of categories. Like, uh, I often like to look at Lord of the Rings as an example for this, right? Uh, we're not talking about Rings of Power. <laughs> we're going to talk about Lord of the Rings. Um, so in Lord of the Rings, you've got both Gollum and Sauron, and I guess, uh, and then Saruman, right? You've got multiple antagonists, but I kind of compare Gollum uh, to Sauron. Uh, Sauron's motivations just, they, they need to be clear, but they do not need to be empathetic, right? We don't need to know, we don't need to empathize for, oh, Sauron, boo you lost your ring. Um, <laughs> Gollum is a different experience because his point in the story is to show where our, our, our hero could go and is going, and is supposed to be, therefore, a really sad um, story. And so with Gollum, um, when I'm writing a character like that, I'm making sure that, the, that it's, the, it's the motivation, like the backstory, that part is understandable. The, you, I, I kind of look for the there but for the grace of God go I sort of moment, right? Um, that, that, you know, any, uh, um, a, a character that we love could go that direction. Um, and that's how I do it. I, I like to set up that contrast. You get another good one with Magneto and Professor X, right? Where it's like, Magneto is the type of character where you're like, wow, I could see how someone would go that direction. And in many ways, that's more terrifying, right? Um, and so for me, what I, I try to do, I back up to those motivations. And I often try to identify the key decisions that sent them the wrong way and imagine who they would have been if they'd gone the right way instead. Oh, I love that. Thank you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank thanks you for the much. excellent question. Woo. Hey, how you doing? Hey, what's up? Uh, so, like, with Brandon Sands, I became a fan of Intentionally Blank before I knew he was this great writer. Woo, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, 
I was watching Wheel of Time, and then I put two and two together. I was like, oh, this is the guy that my friends were telling me 10 years ago. He finished Wheel of Time. Great. And one of my favorite moments in Intentionally Blank is Dan talking about food heist. So, food heist. I was yes. wondering if you guys were going to collaborate on like a fantasy saga involving food heist. Oh, man. Oh, man. What a fantastic question. <laughs> Jeremy, here's some that are finished in case anyone needs to leave. Um, wow. Fan okay, so okay the we got to repeat was, the question. Yep. Um, Fantasy food heists. Are we going to collaborate on, on a fantasy food heist? We need to do that. Why have we not we thought of should. this? We Why have we not considered this? We've I considered don't know. all kinds of things. When you put the two of us together to brainstorm our ideas, sometimes we come up with very normal ideas. Sometimes we are a controlling factor for one another. And then other times we are not. Uh, other times our weirdness builds off of one another and you end up with the weirdest ideas. Uh, we've talked about our, uh, our Abraham Lincoln uh, fanfic uh, of, Mo of Herman Melville. Uh, that sort of thing is what happens. Uh, food heist makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I would love for it to be like in the backdrop of like, well, there's this big epic stuff that's going on in the main story, but the story is really about these side characters. Oh, now food that's, food a, to survive. Man, that's really? a great idea. They're actually doing that. Uh, we we now, need magical food if we're going to have a food heist. Yeah. Magical then, food for the food yeah. heist. Oh, Adam. Adam. What? Wow. Aww. Look at this. This. Well done. <laughs> now we can talk and sign cards wow. at the same time. Producer now I can Adam, talk and well sign done. Cards at the same time. Brandon mm. was already doing it. He's more talented than I am. Um, I will point out that Brandon has already done fantasy food heists a couple of different times. Uh, every time he writes about Lyft. Yeah, every time Lyft is on board. Does she really archives. get to count as a heist? She's just kind of... She's, she's very food petty, petty thievery. Theft. Yes. And, and kind of purposefully petty in everything she does. All right, we need to do a Lyft actual food heist, don't we? We do. Yeah. That would be really fun. Uh, excellent question. Looking forward to it. Yes, hey, we're, we yeah. will do this. We, we, do you have a food heist for next episode? Or uh, previous I can episode get going one. Back in time? People keep sending them to me. I, well, um, people are awesome. Yeah. I oh. haven't looked through them yet, though. Oh, you know, I, I've got, I've got, I've got something for you. A food heist? No, or a bad story no, idea? no, not. We've Ooh. got, we've got the other thing. I'm the other thing. The other thing. Um, we'll do questions. I'll, I'll bring you. I'll, you guys haven't seen it yet because I, I sprung in an upcoming episode uh, a new, uh, a new uh, idea on Dan, and I have another. Yeah. One. Mm. Hey, speaking of episodes that we've recorded and you haven't seen yet, and speaking of us collaborating together. I don't know how many of you know the big announcement. Probably not a lot. Well, uh, as of last week? week and a half ago, I am now officially full-time as vice president of narrative of Dragonsteel, working for Brandon. Mm. And so we are actually going to be writing a whole ton of books together. So, hooray! Yep. The Cosmere has gotten big enough that I need somebody else to help me wrangle it. Uh, <laughs> and so I went to Dan. You forgot to sign this one. Ha, ha, ha. I um, purposefully didn't sign that one. I don't like that one. All right. Dan hates this <laughs> one. All right. Well, That one knows what it did. Yep. There you go. Uh, all right. Next question. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Dan. Uh, congratulations on the new job, Dan. Thank you. Watch the podcast. But I have watched your YouTube lectures. Uh huh. And I had a question that I wanted to ask if I was sitting in the audience. There. Perfect. How do you come up with like names and like how? Ooh. I find myself like specifically like names to say for like Stormlight or like Shard Blades. Uh huh. Because like I find myself spending so much time just like writing down names and then just like throwing them away. Them. Yeah. So the question is, how do we come up with names? Uh, names for our things in our books. Uh, yeah. He says that oftentimes, like writing down a bunch of cool names and then throwing them away and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. how do you name stuff, Dan? Oh man, this is why so many of my books are just set in the real world. How do you name your <laughs> books, though? How do I name my books? Poorly. <laughs> Most of my really good book names, including "I am not a serial killer," uh, came from the editor. Like, I Am Not a Serial Killer was just the name of the file, like, as a placeholder for, this is what this book's about. Obviously, this is a stupid title. I'll come up with something better. And the editor was like, no, you idiot. That's the best title for this. Um, I want to know, yeah. uh, what is the most difficult naming challenge you've had? And I suspect that it is the superhero names Oh, yeah, Reckoners. the superhero names from Reckoners were awfully hard because um, in those... I was uh, looking for names that hadn't been used by Marvel or DC, 
Uh, which turns out they all have been used. Yeah, everything like, you could possibly use for a superhero. Um, and so I had to like default to not used by them or used on such a minor character they haven't appeared since the 70s or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, because man, they have, they churn through the superhero names. But this isn't actually even getting you what you want. So when I was naming um, my first book, Elantris, um, Oh, thank you. What I did is I uh, I had just enough linguistic classes to be dangerous, and yeah, uh, I was a you know I I, I was a rogue linguist, um, and I started building my own language, right? Uh, and I built this language um, around the idea in this case of a real world um, phenomenon. Uh, I speak Korean, and one of the things I find fascinating about Korean uh, Japanese to a lesser extent, but all of that region is kind of influenced by Chinese characters. Uh, and Korean has this cool thing where you can replace a lot of the words with Chinese versions written in Chinese because the Chinese language is logographic, the written form, uh, ra rather than uh, phonetic. Um, and so they will use for emphasis Chinese characters. You might have just a sentence all in Korea and then boom, boom, Chinese characters to be like, pay attention to these or the names will be in Chinese characters. And I like that idea. So I built a kind of a system like that around the aeons, which are these ancient characters that have meaning, but don't have, aren't phonetic, and then a linguistics around them. Uh, and then I built it to have all these kind of cool names that would be pronounced locally to them in really interesting ways. And then I released the book, and the number one review I got, the first review from Kirkus is like, Brandon has a tin ear for names. Nobody can pronounce anything in this book. Uh, <laughs> And I'm like, oh, huh, you know, going, going full on linguist may not have been the best choice in that case. I mean, it certainly achieved something. Uh, for Mistborn then, I, I decided to back off a little bit on that. And what I did is I said, all right, I'm going to name, I'm going to take names in each part of the final empire from a region in Europe. Um, because I, I had started kind of with a French sounding uh, name for both Vin and Kelsier or Kelsier, as they would say. Um, and I decided that I would just, you know, do that. And I would then use kind of my linguistic background to just tweak words so they became fantastical versions. Um, I actually got out an atlas um, of the region. I had Spain, France, um, and uh, Germany. And I was just tweaking names like that. It's not a bad method to use um, for naming just because uh, what it does is you can have a region in your world match kind of to a region in our world. You can kind of lean on the phonetics of that world. You'll still see me doing that now and then. Uh, the other method that I use is I'll come up with some paradigm. For instance, symmetrical names or repeated consonant sounds or something like that. And I will start building words around that. Though even still, I generally like to look to a real world influence to be like, here are sounds that they don't use. Here are sounds they do use just to keep the linguistics sounding similar for a region. Um, so like, you know, if we're, if we're going to, uh, to Roshar, for, for a lot of the Alethi uh, or Voran languages, I am reaching back to, uh, to Hebrew and Arabic. And the older it gets, the more Arabic it gets, uh, or the more like true ancient Hebrew it gets, and the more modern it is, uh, the less I'll have those influences, and more I'll have, it in, uh, have other influences coming in. Uh, this is just the linguistic nerd in me doing this, but I do think you can come up with some little rule for yourself. Repeat some consonant sounds. And Warbreaker works just fine without any, any real world linguistic uh, background to it, just to give you a theme. This, these names are all from the same place. That's what I do. Uh, I just want to point out that I'm always going to pronounce it as Kelsier from now on. You can say Kelsier. With like a really snooty French accent. Yeah. Kelsier. And I'm going to read it that way in my mm -hmm. head. It's going to sound like the chef from Little Mermaid. Do you know why I, it, I picked French names for them all? No. Because of Micah, my roommate, Micah really? Gamo, who Demo. had a cool last name that was French. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I want to use that. And he's like, great. You can use it in your book, but I have to get a girl and I have to survive. <laughs> I'm like, I wasn't going to put you in. And then he's like, if you're going to use my name, I got to be in there. And I got to. So this is where Captain Demo came from. So oh, well, anyway, there you go. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Next question. We are going to have to start answering these questions a lot okay. faster let's if we're going to get let's, through. Let's do some rapid fire modes. Okay. Lightning mm -hmm. round. Lightning round. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Ben. Uh -huh. uh, first off, when is uh, Rhythmatist 2 coming out? Oh, when is Rhythmatist 2 coming out? Eventually. 
uh, for an actual question. Uh, uh huh. How do you temper power creep and progression of a character in fantasy and sci-fi? Ah, uh, what a fantastic question. I don't know if I can answer this one fast. How, how do you temper power creep and uh, character growth in fantasy and sci-fi? Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, my you characters do don't this. have power creep. They don't gain like, Your characters... power over time. They're all, they're horror characters. Their power creep is, oh good, I finally have one bullet for my gun. Mm. Uh, so for me, it's a, it's a couple of things. Uh, Sanderson, second law, right? Uh, flaws are more interesting than powers themselves. Uh, and so power creep, if as long as it is matched by flaws, Right? If you have flaw creep as well as power creep, you will find places for stories. This is the Rand Althor method, right? As Rand gains power, also his flaws become more and more manifest. Same things happen to Quoth, right? Uh, Quoth's, Quoth's arrogance is matched by his, uh, his ability to get things done in society. Um, and, you know, as long as those two things are matching, then you're going to be okay. The other thing is, as long as there are challenges for them to meet, that are creeping up as well. Um, and this doesn't have to mean that, man, you're going way faster than I am. Well, you're um, talking a lot more than I am. That, uh, that, the, that the bad guys have to have the power, though they can have power creep too to, to match them. Just remember that a lot of the best stories are going to take place in the realms where your character, uh, the things your character can't do, rather than the things they can. Um, and this, is, this goes back to the classic Superman problem. What are the three great Superman stories? I've lost my powers, Lois doesn't love me, or there's somebody stronger than me, right? Uh, the, the, and it doesn't matter how powerful Superman is if he can still lose his powers, if kryptonite still exists. It doesn't matter how powerful he is as long as none of the powers make someone fall in love with him or make him able to live a real normal life. And it doesn't matter how powerful he is as long as somebody else more powerful exists out there. And if you're following kind of those three things, you can scale up power level. Uh, it is a real issue. I worry more than power level. I worry about characters going through the same plot arcs too many times. Uh, the thing that bugs me most about network television is the reset button. When you watch a really great season of a show and they get to the end of the show and you have a really dramatic thing where the, you know, the, the, the love interest gets, they, they all like reconcile and they gain new powers or whatever. And then the start of the next season, you can tell they got to the writer's room and said, well, now what? And they're like, we have no idea what to do with this show. Reset button. Oh, they've fallen out of love. Oh, the powers aren't working like that stuff is good. It's always good to throw in conflict, but the reset button drives me up the wall. So uh, I am worried more about doing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Hey, how you doing? By the way, that five minute answer was our lightning round, so. Yeah, yeah. It's, have you seen the size of my books? That was fast. <laughs> um. So I just read Dan's book. Thank you. Night of Black or Darkness. Oh, Night of Black or Darkness. Yeah. Yep. If you want to know how weird Dan can get, A Night of Black or Darkness is your, uh, yeah. So, The Life of Frederick Withers is edited by Cecil G. Wagner III. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. so I was mm -hmm. wondering about um, Bagworth's bibliography. Yes. Now that the tales of Alcatraz Medry are done, yes. will we see Ryan? Uh, Planet of the Rising Sun, or okay. the Travels of Abraham, as told by Abraham Lincoln. So, so the question here is a really deep Brandon and Dan lore question, right? <laughs> Not our book's lore question, Brandon and Dan. So Alcatraz, my children's series, has an editor whose name is Cecil G. Bagsworth III, who is also the editor of A Night of Blacker Darkness, and indeed is referenced in Secret Project 2 quite heavily. Um, when you get to read that uh, next year. Um, and Cecil is an interdimensional time-traveling adventurer slash editor. Yeah. Um, based yeah. on my As brother. As all editors are. Yes, based on my brother, Jordo. Uh, and so this is a joke we had back when we were on a magazine together in college. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can't even remember where it started. We were on the slush pile, uh, reading slush pile yeah. for some reason, and we started joking we about it. We came up with this character that we thought was hilarious, and then we both started putting him into stuff. Yep, we came up with Cecil G. Bagsworth, yeah. the third, and Stet Canister. 
Stet Canister. Yeah, yes, the the intergalactic. He's he's uh, Buck Rogers basically. Yes. Um, um, so the goal originally twenty years ago is that any time we did a collaboration of any kind, yeah, Cecil would be involved. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I am part of the company and writing Cosmere books, I don't know if that yeah we can continue. We cannot put Cecil into the Cosmere. He's not part of the Cosmere, but he can be part of everything else. Yeah. Yes. So, so oh, we need to put him in Dark One then. Oh yeah, he had to, he had oh, to make an appearance in Dark One. So that'd be great. Yes, you will see, be seeing more of Cecil. In fact. There may be an illustration of Cecil in Secret Project 2. So, yes. Yes. If you're really into your Brandon and Dan, and Dan lore, you will love getting an illustration of Cecil. My brother shows up to my wedding, right? He shows up to my wedding in cosplay as Cecil. This is 20, 17 years ago. Full um, top hat, full top monocle. Hat, monocle and sword, um, right? And so, top, like, full, like, like uh, he was in black tie with a top hat. Mm -hmm. uh, and a monocle. Uh, and my brother with a monocle just, he, he looks so smug. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the work that Brandon and I do together is trying to cut back on the amount of inside joke that we inflict upon the public. Yes. Things the podcast is not that. No, the, the podcast, podcast is. Release of inside jokes. Yeah, this so. is us trying to make each other laugh. And if it also makes you laugh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just get to be voyeurs because I have to sign 50,000 things. And I, I brought Dan over to entertain me. Yeah. But good question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, nice short, short blade. Is, is uh, Forged Foam here? Uh, no. Okay. I got this a while ago. Okay. They, they, make, they make foam shard blades for us, so. Uh, they they sometimes have booths. They'll be at Dragonsteel. Ooh. Yes, they usually come to Dragonsteel. So anyway. Uh, hey Brandon, hey Dan. Hey. I wanted to ask about when you were writing The Way of Kings, what inspired you the most when writing about like the values pertaining to leadership in like Kaladin Dalinar's arc? Ooh, okay. Okay, so when I was writing Dra uh no. <laughs> when I was writing Way of Kings, what inspired like the most about the leadership values of Kaladin and Dalinar's arc? Uh, and Jeremy, you may want to just start going down the rows and handing them to people so that uh, so that there's not a rush after the, 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 the yeah. Um, so um, you can probably just hand them a stack and pat them, pass them down, just count out how many people are in this. Yeah. Uh, um, so um, I knew I was going to be writing about war, right? And um, I was going to be writing about soldiers and authority. Uh, and this is a topic that I'm very interested in, but it's also kind of a dangerous topic in some ways because um, we write about, I love fantasy. I love epic fantasy. I love writing about it. Um, but it is very authoritarian, right? Like, you know, it's monarchies a lot of the time. You can squeeze in a democracy or a republic now and then, but you're usually dealing with this because um, we like to, uh, Jeremy's going to come back on the other side and collect them. Jeremy, there's a bunch right up here. Um, and so there's this like there's this like myth that the only great things ca that can be accomplished are by great men, quote unquote. Um, and we play into that in stories, uh, particularly fantasy stories. And I don't want my stories to be about rah rah, you know, autocracy is great, right? <laughs> like that's not what it's about. Uh, it's not but it's not about let's go back to a monarchy. And I want to kind of be clear on that. So I want to make sure that I'm dealing with all the ramifications of it, which means that you're going to end up with terrible leaders sometimes in leadership roles, in really important ones, because you're picking them by who their parents were, not by how good a leader they are. And I also want to show people who are really great leaders who weren't born into that as a method of kind of, a, uh, of showing the consequences. Uh, I think anytime you're doing something a, a little dangerous in that regard, uh, showing the consequences is a good, good way to make sure you're, you're not accidentally making the statement that we should have a king uh, again and things like that. Um, and so to do that, I needed to make sure I was dealing really realistically with the nature of leadership, which meant doing some uh, talking to a bunch of soldiers uh, about, what the, about the command chain and what they feel about it and well, how they feel about the fact that, you know, if you go to college, you're an officer, and if you enlist, you're not an officer and things like that and all of this sort of stuff. And I tried to be as authentic as I could to the experiences of people I'd talked to and the things I'd read. Uh, and that just so that I can make sure it's a, it's a selling point 
and not it's a it's a feature, not a bug that I'm dealing with monarchies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Dan. Hi. Um, so I'm a pretty new uh, Sander Sonian fan. I get I get <laughs> have more knowledge about the Cosmere from my older brother talking to me about it <laughs> without context ad verbatim. So, so it. Uh, it, to preemptively say, I apologize for anyone here whose partner or friend forced them to come to my panel because they have to hear about Brandon Sanderson again. I'm really sorry. So I came here to talk about uh, Moonbreaker. Actually. Okay, Moonbreaker. Okay. I, I, I saw um, the uh, um, the teaser that you did um, uh, talking about like the lore and the audio logs and everything, but we didn't really get a whole lot about the lore itself of Moonbreaker. I was right. curious if there was anything you could talk about there, and if there's any co crossovers or references to the Cosmere itself. Okay, excellent question. So, Dan and I are working together on a video game called Moonbreaker, which is a tactical minis painting video game. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's really cool. It's on Steam. It's uh, from Unknown Worlds, the company that did Subnautica. This is their new thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in early access now. You can get it on Steam. It is incredibly beautiful and cool. Plays really well. The painting is yep. uh, phenomenal. Uh, and and so, Brandon did all the world building, and I'm writing all the stories. Yeah, so the question is, what can we tell you? The thing is, they won't let us tell anything about the story <laughs> or lore that isn't until it comes out. Uh, video game and movie companies tend to be like super tight-lipped on yes. things. I am pushing on the movie side to be like, just let me say stuff, guys. And like, no, you can't say anything. If you say things, then the publicity team won't have a job anymore because it's their job anyway. Um, and so, Which is silly. Um, uh, the basic premise of it is that there is a star with an atmosphere. And so there's... Hundreds of moons kind of swirling around inside of that. You can fly from one to the other, you know, open air, uh, and uh, different crews of things will fight against each other. The physics of that kind of works. Yeah. It's space fantasy, so the yeah. physics can take mm -hmm. a back seat. <laughs> Um, but uh, what can we say? What, is, uh... um, what I know I can tell you, at least structurally, is that uh, every four months they're releasing a new season of the game. And so there will be new uh, units added to the game and new, uh, occasionally new maps and things like that. Season one, which is what's out right now, the launch season has three captains, which is like your main character. And then every season we'll add a new captain. Uh, I am. I just yesterday turned in uh, the episode for uh, the first episode of season two. We're going to have three half-hour audio episodes per season, and so we've introduced the the fourth captain now. At, you know, internally. Um, I yeah. don't know what else we're allowed to tell you except that uh, the okay. game is super cool. I will tell. I will tell you <laughs> this. Said no, and made this your lightning. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, we're bad at that. I can tell you this. Uh, I came up with a really large-scale overarching plot for all uh, everything, and we are not going to get to that, uh, they decided, until we do the backstories of all the captains, which was a smart move. So once you know who all the captains are, then you will find out what the plot of Moonbreaker is. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Um, a much simpler question. The Bridge Four Salute and the stylized S. Yes. Uh, the Reckoners. Okay, Bridge Four Salute. So, Bridge Four Salute was always meant to be this. It's real close to that. And so, we might have to change it, but it's uh, just tapping your wrists together. Oftentimes, they'll do this with uh, the, the bottoms of the wrists, but sides is okay too. Uh, the stylized S from Steelheart is the Superman symbol, which I couldn't say. Uh, well, I probably could have, <laughs> but I just decided not to. Uh, so this, this is why the movie publicity people won't let him talk. Yeah. No, no, if you haven't read Steelheart, it's about a world where uh, there's only supervillains. Superhero apocalypse happens. Supervillains come. Nobody, there's no superheroes. But there is a religion that kind of... Uh, that uses the Superman symbol as their uh, religious icon to be like, someday someone will come who is not evil. Um, and so, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I thought that was really cool when I was writing the books. Use the Superman symbol yeah. as, a, uh, as, a, as a religious symbol. If we could get DC to buy Steelheart, 
Then Ooh. we can actually use it. You yeah. listening, DC? Yes, yes. Uh, Cosmere question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so try not to be too spoilery about books that haven't, people haven't read yet. But, uh, but you, since most of them can't hear, you can say it to me and I can okay. try to, yeah. So we know that um, finer gemstones like the King's Drop um, can hold Stormlight longer and mm -hmm. pieces, other things that I won't say because it's spoilers. Yeah. Is that because of the craftsmanship connecting their identity in the cognitive realm? Uh, excellent question. So uh, in Stormlight, it's a very detailed Cosmere question. In Stormlight, um, you can um, hold, you can hold uh, stormlight and gemstones, and the more perfect the gemstone, the more stormlight it'll hold. Is this deal, uh, is, this, is the craftsmanship uh, that required to create it part of the reason why? And no, it's actually the crystal structure, crystalline structure. So fewer flaws uh, in the crystalline structure means fewer places for the stormlight to wiggle out. Can I ask you a quick yes or no? Yes. Do gemstones exist naturally on Roshar, or are they all like gem parts? Uh, do gemstones exist naturally on Roshar? Yes, but n you, you got to dig through lots of layers of cremstone to get to them. So most of the time, you're getting them from gem hearts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh huh. And if you want to ask more questions like that, I do have my uh, my hour and a half uh, solo panel um, that I'll be doing on uh, I guess tomorrow. Is it? Um, and that hour and a half solo panel uh, will involve a, at least a 45 minute Q&A. So if you really want to get your questions uh, answered from me, you also will have a chance then. Because we are running pretty low. We got 10 minutes left, so. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, I'll be very quickly. You go ahead. Um, first off, just want to say big fan of your work. Um, it was incredible for me uh, to read Oathbringer and Rhythm of War as I was finishing up my years at school to become a therapist. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I guess what I wanted to ask is, you know, no spoilers for Rhythm of War, but what was your inspiration for a certain character uh, to begin essentially inventing therapy? Okay, so the question is, um, <laughs> uh, in uh, the Stormlight Archive, um, I have a character essentially start inventing some modern versions of uh, therapy, right? Um, what was my inspiration for that? Uh, we can probably both talk about mental health in books. Dan's, mm -hmm. uh, Dan deals with this a lot. Uh, I realized early on in developing the Stormlight Archive that mental health was going to be a theme um, because I have start, had started to realize that, um, that we didn't see enough people struggling with mental health issues in fantasy fiction. Why do I say that? Well, most people I know, uh, the vast majority, are dealing with something. In fact, I think we probably all, all are in some way or another. Uh, and yet, in fantasy, you saw the same couple of things show up time and time again, but you really didn't see just heroes who have depression rather than heroes that depression is the main story for them uh, and things like that. And so I, it's one of the things I wanted to start doing. I have a lot of loved ones uh, that, that, that struggle with some of these issues, and I'm just like, I feel it's really authentic to life, and I want to be authentic to life. Uh, particularly some of the things I was going to be putting people through, I'm like, well... Again, it's just consequences. Um, there are certain stories you can tell where you don't have to deal with PTSD, um, but I was trying to be very authentic with some of the, the way I was dealing with war um, and things in the Stormlight. I'm like, PTSD is going to be an issue. Um, and so if I'm gonna be doing these things, one of the issues you run into in fiction is how do you, act, how do you, how do you be authentic, but also not accidentally harmful, right? Um, and this is a, a, a particular an issue for people who write um, fantasy. Because, for instance, do you want to show like racism and sexism on the level that it would be authentic for most societies that are as insular as a lot of these societies are? Or even if they're not insular, uh, that's sometimes even worse uh, in terms of like racism and things like that. Or do you... Uh, do you not? Because if you do, you have the danger of saying, hey, this is okay. We're normalizing it because characters that you like are also hugely sexist. Uh, and the same sort of thing happens with, uh, with uh, mental health, where it's like, do you want to normalize not getting help for mental health, health issues? Do you want to play into this idea that, you know, the character's just strong enough, they can just push through it. You should just be strong enough to just push through it, which is a really har harmful attitude that our society has. Uh, particularly with men, uh, but basically everybody's probably been told who has some of these, oh, just soldier on, you know, just be happy. Um, and uh, I realized early on that if I, if I wanted to show these things, I could show some of that because it is authentic, 
but I should try to be um, helpful at the same time and show paths that, uh, is, according to our best understanding of mental illness now, are good paths toward, um, toward recovery. Uh, as best I could in a fantasy world, which is just kind of on the, in the industrial revolution basically, but in a fantastical one, the best I could. I decided I needed to do that just kind of as a, for a moral reason, uh, to, to give an out to people who might be reading this and might not know that there is an out. Um, so that's why I did it. Yeah, awesome. I don't have much to add to that. Uh, I try to include uh, mental health issues and treatment in most of my books. Uh, and it's a very tricky line to walk between depicting something and sensationalizing something. Yeah. Uh, American media in particular is like, oh, if there's someone with a mental illness in your story, they're probably the bad guy. Uh, which is, again, a very harmful uh, stereotype that, that we keep perpetuating, which is awful. Uh, if anyone so out there is interested in this kind of reasons. stuff, if you're a writer and you want to uh, you know, cover these kind of issues, what I have found is there's a lot of books, like kind of self-help books and family books that are like, this is how to live with someone who has schizophrenia. This is how to take care of a loved one who has depression. Those tend to be really, really wonderful resources for writing this kind of thing. Um, and also, you know, I've got, you know, children and siblings and all kinds of people in my family that I can talk to directly. And, and I have a lot of experience taking care of, you know, a psychotic son, things like that. So that, that is more useful for the fiction, I think, than the, the more clinical descriptions of what an illness is. Yeah. Um, and even it, it's, 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 it's difficult to even talk about it because I just said, oh, there's a way out. Well, there's not really a way out, right? Um, mm -hmm. What there is is there's a path toward, uh, toward management, management, right? And it's, it, being responsible with this in media is one of those challenging things. Being responsible you know, with, with depictions of violence is another one. Yeah. There's all sorts of uh, things that we, we balance and sometimes we do well and sometimes we do poorly. So. Yeah, so like right now we're working on a novelization of Dark One. It's mm -hmm. a graphic novel that he put out uh, a while ago. Really, it's not a novelization of the... No, it's not a novelization of the graphic novel. It is a novel anyway. Yeah. Um, but the main character is uh, um, has some mental health challenges. And part of the story is that at times he is medicated and at times he is not. And it has been difficult for us to figure out how to present that in a way that doesn't make people think, oh, he's just better without meds. Maybe I'm better without meds. Yeah. And, and, and that would be very irresponsible of us. And at the same time, we don't want to depict, oh, he's super boring when he's on his meds. Maybe I'm super boring when I'm on my meds. Like, there's, y y we have to be able to present that in a way that is really fun and really interesting without being sensationalized or irresponsible. It's hard but it is worth the effort. Excellent question. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, true, true lightning round. True, true lightning round. You have to only give one sentence. One sentence each or one sentence one total? One sentence each okay. with one semicolon. Okay. question for you. Are you gonna be the next playable character in Fortnite? Am I gonna be the next playable for character in Fortnite? No. I am. No. Have you figured out how old you think you're going to be when you finish the Cosmere? How old am I going to be when I finish the Cosmere? My goal is by age 72. Okay. And you can tell he's thought about that because he didn't say 70. No. Nope. I did the math. Uh, I'll keep it quick. Uh, what new uh, fantasy uh, authors or media have you guys seen recently that you'd recommend? That, and why do you like it? What new fantasy authors or media um, recently we that we recommend? I mean, uh, it's still, it's pretty famous. Uh, Fonda Lee's Greenbone Saga, Jade City, Jade War, Jade Legacy, best fantasy I've read in forever. Uh, really, really phenomenal stuff. I'll just go with Brian's, um, I really like Brian McClellan's uh, Shadow of Lightning. In the Shadow of in Lightning. The Shadow of Lightning. Um, uh, and media-wise, uh, Arcane, if you haven't seen it, but we did a whole episode on that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also, I want to give a shout out to Reservation Dogs. It's a show on Hulu uh, about 
teens growing up on a reservation in Ohio or Oklahoma, one of the two, and uh, it gets, gets far more supernatural than you would expect. Uh, it's my favorite show on TV right now. Hey. Hey. Uh, good to meet you. And uh, so I'm a writer, unpublished, still trying to find an agent. Can you give some quick tips on um, when I'm writing a slot first person narrative of like, uh, can you give like uh, tips between how you balance self reflection of that character's narrative and uh, pushing the story forward? Great. With a first person narrative, how do you balance uh, re reflections oh, man. Uh, versus moving the story forward? It's going to depend on how interesting the voice of the character is. First person for me turns on how interesting it is to be listening to that person. And so if that voice is fascinating, I let myself or the author I'm reading go a little further into self-reflection than I would in third person. Uh, in, in lightning round, one sentence response is, uh, we've got another podcast called Writing Excuses. Everything we could possibly say right now, we've already said more intelligently there. So go and listen to that. Thank you. Thank All you. right. We have to be done with this episode, but the rest of you can come to my thing tomorrow uh, and ask questions there. Um, and indeed, uh, um, I'll try to remember if you're there to call you up first, okay? All right? All right. So if you're there, I will, I will try to remember to say, first, the people who can't. But if you can't be there, uh, then uh, another time. Another time. Thank you, guys, because we do have to keep moving, right? So we have to end this episode. Thank you. Thank you're you all. Wonderful. You're wonderful. How's that, New York Comic Con? Yeah.